So let's just start, though, with the term people pleaser so that you and I are on the same page. People pleaser refers to a person who just has a strong desire to please other people, even if pleasing other people comes at their own expense. And if you struggle with people pleasing, I certainly used to. I mean, those of us that were parent pleasers, we grew up to be people pleasers. And so if you struggle with this and you often feel like your own wants or needs don't matter, or you tend to bend yourself into knots around other people, or you find yourself having a really hard time just being yourself or saying what you really want to say, you're not alone. And you're going to get all kinds of awesome tools today. And the other thing that's interesting about the research that we did to prepare for this episode is that people pleaser, that's not a medical term. That is not some sort of diagnosis that psychologists use. That is simply a way that we describe casually this coping mechanism that we all engage in in order to keep the peace, in order to fit in, in order to feel love. There are four takeaways that I want to give you really quickly, and then we're going to go to Janet's question. Number one, every human being is a people pleaser. Everybody. Unless you're some narcissistic jerk or you've got some other neurological condition that prevents you from truly bonding with other people, in order to get through life, you have to make other people happy. You have to, for example, put your boss's needs ahead of yours if you expect to remain employed. It is what it is. Your spouse and your kids, they come first at time. Your parents, when you were little, you wanted to please them. And there are times where you need other people to be happy with you. Like when you're at the DMV, that clerk that you hope does you that quick favor, you better make sure that they're happy with you. Or the person who's throwing the big party in Cabo over spring break, definitely you're a people pleaser around that person. I don't blame you. You want the invite. That's the big takeaway. You're not the only one that struggles with this. Second takeaway, you're never going to get rid of people pleasing entirely. I wouldn't want you to. You can't because some level of people pleasing is necessary in life because relationships are a give and take. And what we're going to talk about today is the balance. How do you balance other people's needs and your own? Third takeaway, people pleasing is only a problem if you do it by default. So if you're the kind of person that is so focused on other people, you don't even know who you are anymore. You've been neglecting your own needs or silencing your own voice, or you constantly feel like a doormat that everybody walks on. People pleasing is definitely a problem for you. And this is something that I want you to get ahead of because I want more for you. You're going to get more out of your life when you're more self-aware about when you start putting other people first and abandoning yourself. And so today I'm going to probably make you pretty shocked at how prevalent this is for you so that you can start making different decisions moving forward. And that leads me to the fourth takeaway. You can take your power back. My mission today is to help you understand the topic, gain more self-awareness so that you can interrupt this pattern and you can create a different pattern, which is making conscious decisions in your day-to-day -day life that truly empower you. Because you can learn how to consciously choose when you are going to put other people first and when you're not and you're going to put yourself first. So let's start with a question. This one comes from a listener named Janet. Hey Mel, so the way I was raised was that what defines a good woman is what she can do for others, for her children, for her husband, whatever. And you always came second, whether it was you were the last to take a shower before you went out, you were the last to eat at a, at a family event, whatever it was. So my biggest struggle now is doing creating self-love for myself without feeling guilty, without feeling like I'm not being humble enough or without feeling like I'm less of a mother or less of a wife because I'm taking care of myself. Um, I know it's the other way. I know that I have to take care of me so I can take care of others, but I just have a hard time doing it without feeling that guilt. To me, it literally feels like a child learning to walk. Um, I don't know how to do it without feeling guilt. I want to remove that guilt from inside of me. Janet, I got some bad news. You can't remove the guilt. I'm going to say that again. When you first start putting yourself first, you will not remove the guilt. And so I just want to be honest about that. 
but let me give you the two takeaways, okay, that are really important because this really isn't about guilt. This is about you defining for yourself what it means to be a good wife and a good mother and a good person in your eyes. And so I'm going to give you two major wake-up calls that I had around this topic, and then I'm going to tell you this crazy story. So the first wake-up call that I got is this notion that the people who love you, they will be annoyed with you when you put yourself first. It is true. They are not going to like it. They like you being the person that you are right now. It is convenient for them that you put them first. It is wonderful, the dynamic that's in place, but it's no longer good for you. So just expect that the people who you love will be annoyed or disappointed or upset when you start putting yourself first, but they're still going to love you. It's not an either or thing. And I'll explain more about that. And second, this is a huge wake up call. What if the guilt doesn't go away? What if guilt is actually a good thing? What if guilt is super healthy to feel right now? In fact, that's what I believe. I believe that the guilt is good. I believe that the guilt is healthy. And I believe that you can reframe it. See, guilt shows that you care. That's why you feel that way. If you were a narcissistic douchebag, you wouldn't feel guilty at all for putting yourself first. I want to frame guilt in a different way for you, okay? Let's frame it from a bad sign. Ooh, I'm doing something bad. I'm putting myself first into a good one. Stop seeing guilt as a bad thing because you're not doing anything wrong when you put yourself first. Start seeing guilt as a good thing. Guilt is a sign that you're breaking free of this people-pleasing habit. You feel guilty because putting yourself first is just a new feeling. That's it. You know, I had this insight a few years ago that I think might help you. Two things can be true in life at the same time. You can put yourself first and disappoint people, and they can still love you even though they're disappointed. And here's another example of how two things can be true at the same time. You can feel guilty and you can still put yourself first. Pretty cool. It's not an either or. And that's why I say that this topic about people pleasing is about balancing your needs with the fact that in order to have great relationships, you do have to compromise sometimes. And the balance comes in because in order for you to have the life that you want, you are going to disappoint people that you love sometimes. I, I experience this all the time. I'm 54 years old. I still want to make my parents happy. Why? Because I love them. And because that's what I've always done. And so when I get into one of those moments where it is a balancing act, it's not easy. And I'm going to tell you a story about this. My dad is an enormous billiards fan. And when he was in either college or medical school, he used to hustle for money at a pool hall. Like he is a great pool player. And I grew up in a town called Muskegon, Michigan which is the world headquarters of a company called Brunswick, which used to make all of the old pool tables. And so my dad became just a huge fan of collecting antique pool and billiard artifacts. In fact, my parents' house is full of them. Old pool balls, pool cues, the little counting-like things that hang on the ceiling, artwork, a pool, to, like just all chairs from billiards. My dad loves this stuff. So when Chris and I got married, he gave us a refurbished Brunswick pool table that dated back to the 1800s. And it had been in a Vikings lodge in Muskegon, Michigan. And he ended up buying it at an auction, had it refurbished. And it was like the greatest thing ever. But here's the problem. When Chris and I got married, we lived in an apartment. Like, whose apartment has room for a pool table? And so this beautiful pool table sat in my parents' basement in North Muskegon, Michigan, for over a decade. And so all this time goes by. Chris and I have now moved to Boston. We've bought our first house. It is a teeny 
tiny antique farmhouse. There was not a single room that was big enough to clear a pool table. I don't know if you understand how a pool table works. I didn't realize that you need four and a half feet clearance around the pool table in order to play pool. This was like not something I was aware of. So we couldn't even fit it in our house when we first bought a house. It couldn't fit in the basement because we had a dirt basement. You're not going to put a pool table down there. So more years go by. And then Chris and I finally have enough money to refinance the house and put on a small addition. We were going to put on a garage with a room above the garage. That's what we were going to do. And to my dad, he was like, great. That means the pool table finally has a home. Now, given that I did not know that you needed a certain amount of space to put the pool table in, I had envisioned that this room above the garage would be the kid's playroom, right? And I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, it's a two-car garage, so clearly we could put a pool table in there and it'd be the kid's playroom. So get this, my dad is so excited that I fly back to Michigan and he and I take a road trip in a U-Haul where we drive across country from Michigan all the way to Boston together and we bring back all kinds of stuff from my parents' basement and we split a bunch of plants from their yard and the pool table was in the back. And my dad hires somebody to meet us there and we assemble the pool table. And when they finally finished assembling this pool table, it sat in the middle of this playroom like a felted aircraft carrier. Our playroom, as it turns out, was only big enough to put a pool table in it. No room for the couch, no room for the kids play table, just a big ass antique pool table that was a sign of my father's love and devotion to his daughter. Did I want the pool table there? Well, for the first year or two, it was great. But then it literally just collected dust. And as the kids got older, it became the table that they played Legos on. And then it became the table that I folded laundry on. And then my business started to grow. And I started thinking, boy, it'd be awfully nice to have an office, a place to uh, work. But I didn't dare disassemble that pool table. Why? Uh, the thought of disappointing my father? Heartbreaking. Now, keep in mind, he's only at my house once or twice a year. So we're talking maybe four or five days out of 365 days is the man going to see the pool table. But nevertheless, like a dutiful daughter, because I love him and I did not know what I know now, I thought that in order to have my dad love me, that meant that I had to just keep this pool table like a uh, mausoleum, is that the word? that uh, represented, uh, you know, my father and my duty and my loyalty. And as my company began to grow, we put plywood on top of the pool table and we worked on that. And then finally I thought, what the hell am I doing? I am a grown ass woman. I need to disassemble the pool table. My dad will understand. I will assure him that the second that I am successful enough to add on to this house again or do something else, the first thing that I will do is build a room where we can put a pool table. I wish I had more money. I wish I had a bigger house. I wish I had one of those great rooms that people have that you could launch a cannon through. But that is not my life and it is not what my needs are. And in order to put my needs first and my business first and for my kids to have a place to, to be able to be too, I can't have this felted aircraft carrier in the middle of this room. I need to take the room back. And so I'll never forget this day. I picked up the phone to call my dad. And when I heard his voice, I immediately started to chicken out. Hey, Mel, what's up? Hey, dad. And of course, I talk about nothing. And my stomach ache is churning and I'm starting to feel stress diarrhea coming on. And finally, I'm like, okay, God, Mel, five, four, three, two, one. You're not eight years old anymore. You just feel like you are. And I'm like, dad, I got to talk to you about something. He's like, yeah, what's up? Okay, so the pool table you gave us, 
yeah, yeah. How, how's it going? You guys love using it. Like, I'm so happy. Your brother, they just moved into their house in Chicago. And so the, the table that I gave them, it's in their basement. We played last weekend. My heart is sinking in my chest. This is not going according to plan. So I take a deep breath. I said, Dad, yeah, about the pool table. My business is growing so fast. I really need a place for the people that work for me to come and work. Oh, great. And they're going to love playing on the pool table too. Like, you know, the cool offices all have pool tables and ping pong. Dad, um, I don't have enough room um, in the room that it's in. Oh, well, it could go in the living room. Like if you got, Dad, I, I like it just can't because the living room's not big enough. So what are you saying, Mel? Well, what I'm saying is I was going to hire the guy that you hired to like level it and put the slate in to come back and lovingly like take it apart. And I was going to store it in a really loving way until I have a place for it. Silence. You want to know how I felt in that moment? I felt like the world's worst daughter. I felt like an ungrateful piece of shit. Because through the silence, I could feel my dad's heart sink. And it was a really hard thing to do. And that's why I say this is a balance. Like it's so easy to say on a TikTok video, just say no. When it's somebody that you love and you know that you're going to disappoint them, that's not easy. And you can still do it. And what's interesting about that moment is it, it didn't feel like this victory. It didn't feel like, yeah, there was this residue there because I knew that he was disappointed. And I was disappointed too. I wish I had a bigger house. I wish I could accommodate this beautiful gift. I wish that I had a basement that it could go in. I wish I lived closer to them. And so all of that emotion came crashing in in that moment. And that's why I'm gonna keep on saying, learning how to balance those moments when you know that your decision that is truly best for you and what you need is going to disappoint someone. Remember that two things can be true. You can do what's right for you and you can have somebody be disappointed in you and you can know that deep down they still love you. I mean, people that you love disappoint you all the time, all the time, and you still love them. And it's a real art to learn how to be in those moments with grace and advocate for yourself and still hold space for somebody to be upset with you or disappointed in you or sad about it. That's what that moment was. It was just both of us feeling disappointed that it wasn't different. And, you know, do they tease me when they come over? Of course they did. For years they did. This was pretty recently, by the way, everybody. So I'm just remembering back to the fact that when I released the five second rule book, it was 2017 and I self-published that and we did all of the internal layouts. Do you know what I used that pool table for? It was our creative desk where I laid out the entire <laughs> design of the five second rule book. So I'm talking less than five years ago, everybody, I had this conversation with my father. And whenever they would come visit, they would walk in and they'd look in the direction of where my office was and nice pool table. Or every time I would say, yeah, I'd love grandma's uh, table from the kitchen. And then my mom would, you know, <laughs> say something snarky like, oh, is it going to end up in the basement with the pool table? You sure you want it? And you know what? They're allowed to say that. They're allowed to be disappointed. They're allowed to call me out on that. And I have to create space for them to have their feelings. And I also believe that that's one of the things we don't talk about a lot in relationships and people pleasing. Like you think when you're people pleasing, it's all one way. It's not. It's a give and a take. 
If you want other people to make room for the very real emotions that you feel and the reason why you need to put yourself first in certain circumstances, then you got to show up and hold up your end of the bargain and make room for their feelings of disappointment and confusion and sadness. And just know that when somebody is given the space to process it or to make a joke or say something snarky, because let's face it, do you know what's underneath that snarky comment? Oh, is it going to end up in the basement like the pool table? It's hurt. It's sadness that's not processed in a healthy way. And so just keep in mind that, yes, when you start putting yourself first and when you start making decisions, you will disappoint other people. Give them space to feel that and know that they will still love you. They do, even if they don't express it in a constructive way. And also know that you can feel guilty. I sure as hell felt guilty. And you want to know what? I still feel guilty, even though it's not my fault. And I feel so guilty that, you know what? Now that we're here in Southern Vermont and I've built this dream house of mine, I made damn fucking sure that in the barn, you better believe there's not only space for that pool table. I built a barn so that we could put the pool table in there. So dad, I know you're listening. You get your ass up here because I'm going to beat you in a game of pool when you do come, okay? And I can't wait. Um, and yeah, I still feel a little guilty. Why? Guilt is good. It means I care. And it means I am expanding my capacity to live in that balance, to do things that really work for me and know that that is not going to work for some other people. And that's okay. That's what it's all about. We're going to talk about people pleasing, and I am going to teach you the art and the science of putting yourself first. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs>